Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. You know, for almost 18 years, I was the lead singer and co-founder of one of the all-time biggest Christian bands in the world. Um, Thank you, one fan. (laughs) Thanks, mate. (laughs) Uh, At the heights of success when I was with the Newsboys, we were selling millions of albums, uh, bringing in over $15 million a year, countless number one songs, uh, golden platinum albums, Grammy nominations, filling the biggest arenas in this nation. But it was so easy for people so often to look at me up on the stage, this celebrity singing all their famous hits. And people used to look at me like my life must have been perfect. They used to look at me and think, you must be the result of having such a loving, caring, supportive, nurturing family. You must have been the result of such an amazing, healthy upbringing. They used to look at me and think, somebody like you, You must be so clever, so talented, so gifted, so smart. I wish all of that was true because it sounds lovely, doesn't it? It sounds like a trailer for one of those really cheesy Christmas Hallmark movies that my wife forces me to watch now. But it couldn't be further from the truth. I I look at my journey. I was born into the most abusive, toxic, dysfunctional, broken family. We were abandoned by our parents. Let me tell you quickly about my dad back then. After the beatings and the abuse, and and God only knows what that man did to my four sisters, my brother, my poor mum. Dad just walked out and left us. He just abandoned us. When kids need a dad, a role model, a mentor, a hero, he was gone. Unfortunately, when he left by then, he had done such a number of verbal and physical abuse. My poor mum was a battered emotional wreck. And unfortunately, mum never had the capacity at that time to care for us. And mum walked out and left us also. Now, my school experience, my school journey wasn't that enjoyable. I was kicked out, expelled from practically every school I ever attended. I can remember being a child growing up, I had no sense of value, no sense of worth, no sense of a meaning or a future or a destiny for my life. I remember back then as a child, I used to feel like if I died tomorrow, who cares? If I died tomorrow, no one's going to come to my funeral and shed a tear and mourn my departure from this world. Because truly back then, friends, I had no sense of value. No sense of worth, no sense of a future or a hope or a purpose to my life. But at the age of 15, in a little town in the middle of nowhere in the outback of Australia, the most incredible thing happened to me. I'll never forget it. I remember I was walking home from school one day. It was actually from a painful detention experience. I remember it. I'm still scarred. I'm walking home from school And somehow in the street, I met a stranger and a conversation was struck up. At the time, I thought it was just some random coincidental encounter with just some stranger in the street in the middle of nowhere in a little outback town in the middle of Australia. Oh, but friends, little did I know that something far greater was taking place at that moment than anything I could ever imagine. Little did I know that through that coincidental encounter with a stranger in the street, little did I know that through that young man, the kingdom of God was on a collision course with my life. I just didn't know it yet. Through that young man, he was going to be the vehicle that God would use to change the course of my life forever. And maybe you here today at church, I don't know, you're a regular Somebody invited you. Somebody dragged you along. (laughs) Maybe they said, oh, you got to come to church today. We have Steve Irwin's cousin speaking at our church today. I don't know. I I don't know what brought you here. Maybe there's some of you that don't even want to be here. But can I suggest to all of us today that maybe it's no accident you're here today. Maybe it's no accident Tanya and I are here. 
Maybe today the kingdom of God is on a collision course with your life and you might not just realize it yet. Through that young man, he introduced me to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Through his influence, I started following after this man called Jesus. I had no idea what it meant, what I was meant to do, what was up ahead. I just did my best to walk towards the kingdom of God and start this journey of discipleship and discovering Christ. A little while later, I moved away from that small outback town to another small town on the east coast of Australia called Malulaba. Anybody heard of that? Oh, I didn't think so. <laughs> a small town on the east coast of Australia. One day at church, I'm a new Christian, going, going to church, a new believer. One day at church, I meet another young man. And a friendship has struck up. And through the friendship, I discovered that him and a few other mates were talking about starting a band. I thought, a band? That sounds awesome. I quickly learned they had no lead singer. So obviously, I elected myself. I never sung a note in my life except in the shower. But I thought, crikey, how hard can it be? We're not working for NASA here. It's not rocket science. Come on. So we started a band in a garage, annoying the heck out of the neighbours every Saturday. One day, we decided to come to America. We thought, we can go to America and use music as a vehicle to bring people a message of hope found in Jesus Christ. We thought, in America, right? Everybody there in America loves music, yes? Well, except country music, eh, Pastor? But everybody loves music, so... We came to America with a dream, a bunch of uneducated, barbaric, <laughs> but passionate Aussie boys that were crazy enough to believe that God actually had a purpose and a plan for our lives, just like he does for every one of you here today. And it has nothing to do with how good you have been or haven't been. It has nothing to do with your education or lack of. It has nothing to do with your age, gender, nationality, skin color. God has an incredible, magnificent purpose, plan, and destiny for every man, woman, and child alive. So At the heights of success, I began to cut anchors from my life, stabilizing ropes, influences, boundaries that we all have. Don't look at me like, well, that only applies to you because you're in that crazy music industry. Oh, let me say, you can be a housewife, a gardener, a carpenter, an accountant, a nurse, a doctor, unemployed. Anchors that we all have to keep us grounded. Oh, especially if you call yourself a follower of, of Christ, a Christian. Let me tell you a couple of the anchors that I cut from my life I didn't think it, was, it would matter, or was I wrong? The first anchor I cut from my life was the absolute essential importance of my daily devotion to God. Lord, I'm just so busy this week. And come on, church, let's be honest. Doesn't life have a tendency to get us all so busy? Seriously, there's barely enough hours in the day. What I need to get done with my family commitments, my job, my, my work commitments... It's like there's barely enough time each day. Lord, I'm just so busy now. I know I'm meant to begin to build this into my life, but I'm so busy. Next week, I promise you, God, I'll get back. I'll have twice as many devotions with you next week. Well, next week comes and, oh, look out. We're going into the studio to record our brand new worship album, our brand new album that's going to reach millions of people around the world with a message of hope found in Jesus. Eventually, I got to a place where I stopped having my devotions altogether. I mean, in the busyness of my life, just stopping and taking a few moments each day, giving God the first fruits of my day, opening up His Word, just spending time, a few moments, reading His Word, praying, allowing His Spirit to speak and strengthen me. Newsflash, church, more than ever in this world, in this culture we live in today, you have zero to no chance of walking the life as a disciple of Christ that he has called us to walk if you aren't deliberately building an addiction in your life in regards to your commitment and hunger for your daily devotion to God. 
We can't come to church every week as like we're babies expecting pastor to spoon feed us every week. So often we realize we have to take responsibility of cultivating our personal devotion and intimacy with God. We have to start that journey. You know, in the natural, we look after these bodies, don't we? We feed it regularly. One, two, three meals, sometimes more. I find if I don't miss a meal, I start to get irritable. I start to get angry. I can't function. I'm like, just give me some food. And God forbid if I miss a whole day, it's like the universe is coming to an end. It's like we, we do our best to nourish and nurture and feed this body. Because we understand for us to have the capacity and the ability to function, we need to fuel the body. But now we come to the Word of God that is alive and active and powerful. That the Word of God that is the foundational building block of our intimacy and devotion. Getting to know God, not only through our worship, but through the Word of God that has the ability to renew our minds, to change us on the inside. It's like we eat crumbs and we expect that's going to give me what I need to be a disciple for Christ. It's like, but don't worry, we have the app. I have the app and each day I get my Jesus sprinkle. <laughs> my, my one little verse that tells me how incredible I am and how I am the center of the universe according to God. Now listen, if that's where you're starting, fantastic. Start there. But let me say, as you follow the Lord, I pray that you begin to grow with a hunger just like we do in the natural, you'll begin to grow a hunger to know Him through the Word of God. That we begin to have an appetite. You know, my wife and I, we've made a commitment to each other. Especially in the craziness of what's going on in this country today. We've realized and we made a commitment to each other and the Lord that we will not leave our home. I mean, wherever we're staying, hotel, whatever. We will not walk out the door of our home to start a new day unless we have first spent time with the Lord. Spending time in His presence, allowing Him to give us the strength and the courage and the hope, allowing His presence to refresh us daily. Friends, when you begin to cut anchors like that from your life, the importance of my daily devotion... The next anchor I cut from my life was the absolute essential importance of my family. You know, my wife back then, my ex-wife now, you know, my family back then needed more than anything. Was not more lifestyle, more holidays, more vacations, more money. We had all of that and more than we could ever spend or enjoy. So what was my family back then craving, desperately needing? Was dad just to be there for them. That they were a priority in my life and not a PS. See, daddy's off saving the world. Saving everyone else's family, everybody else's marriage, everybody else's family. But right under my own roof, I'm losing my own marriage. My own family. The final anchor I cut from my life, I didn't think it would matter. Oh, was I wrong? Was the absolute essential importance of staying connected, grounded, plugged in, and serving in a local church. Oh, you don't understand. God has given me this ministry that He's taking me to the world, to the nations and beyond. Actually, the local church doesn't get it. So I have to cut my ties with the local church because God is releasing me in this incredible ministry. Hmm, what a load of rubbish. Sorry if I burst your entrepreneurial ministry model or idea. Listen, nothing supersedes the incredible miracle and importance about being plugged in and serving and involved in the most incredible organism called local church family. See, when church is done right, 
Local church isn't here to crush your dreams. You might have dreams in God of what you want to do in the business community out there or in this, in this nation. Local church isn't here to crush your dreams and institutionalize you and lock you in. On the contrary, local church is here to equip and empower and release you with the dreams you have. You, you might have a vision as a carpenter, as a builder. Go figure this released in the ministry out there. I reached, I meet so many church folks and they're like, well, Brother John, one day I'm going to be in the ministry. Hmm. I'm like, what's that? In the ministry? You want to be in the ministry? Huh, huh, huh. There I ordained you. Go. You're all in the ministry. How about that? When Jesus said, come follow me, and you said, yes, Lord, and you started on the journey, guess what? You're in the ministry. You enlisted in the army of God. He has a, you know, people think ministry. Listen, you may be a school teacher. How about that? You're in the ministry. You've been released to be the kingdom of God in the teaching world. You may be a doctor, kingdom of God released. A carpenter, kingdom of God released. When you enlisted in the army of God, you did not enlist to be a spectator. You did not enlist to fill a seat every Sunday. Could you imagine if this week we all decided we're going to go out and enlist in the armed forces of America. Why? Because I love the uniform. <laughs> we even get a little badge and maybe some medals and a cool hat and shiny boots. I just love the uniform and we enlist in whatever branch of the armed forces. Could you imagine on the first day of training, if you when you showed up, you realized, oh, wait a second, I don't want to do that. <laughs> That's, that's what sort of commitment and discipline. You're going to ask me to do what and need be? You're going to ask me to put my life on the line to defend the flag in this nation, in my home? Oh, no, 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 no. I didn't enlist for that sort of thing. I just enlisted because I love the uniform and the title. <laughs> we come to God with this mindset. Oh, no, no, no. I, I've enlisted. I go to church. I know. I love the benefits, the insurance policy but I don't want to do anything. <laughs> I don't want to actually die to self. <laughs> I don't actually want to take up my cross and follow him. Uh, but I want, I want prosperity and blessing and healing. It's like, come on. It, with that sort of attitude in the natural, I don't think you'd survive long in the, in the armed forces. Amen. You wouldn't last long, but we come to God so often with this mindset. Local church is here where we plug in we serve, we commit, we're involved in the miracle. So often we look for a church where the grass is greener. Oh, I want to go to this other city or this other church or this other place. Oh, God's moving there. You know where the grass is greenest, church? Where God has you planted today. Where God has you planted today. When you cut those anchors from your life, you're a train wreck about to happen. It might not happen today. It might not happen tomorrow. It might not happen for six months. But I guarantee you somewhere down the road, there is a disaster waiting for you. At the heights of success, gaining the world, living the dream in the Christian music industry in America. My marriage, my family, and my personal life fell apart. But shh, don't tell anybody. You can't tell people your, your marriage is falling apart. You're the lead singer of one of the biggest Christian bands in the world, this massive ministry. You're, you're a role model, a leader. You... So we make the dumb mistake of wearing a mask, living a lie, and the show must go on. Hoorah. Eventually, uh, I couldn't deal with the guilt or the shame or the hypocrisy and I think God also had had enough and said enough is enough. And um, when I opened up to the band and told them the state of my marriage, that my wife was on the brink of leaving me, told them everything. A couple of days later, the band came back and it was unan unanimously decided that as of that moment, I was forced to step down and resign from the band. <sighs> my world was shattered. <laughs> 
<laughs> how do you let go of that? For almost 18 years, the newsboys was my life. <laughs> was my dream, my aspirations, my sense of validation, my sense of worth, my success. It was everything. And now this is raped from me. But at that shocking moment, I came to the terrible realization, exactly that, that my sense of worth and value was, was not in God, in my relationship and who he was. It was in my career and my ministry and my work. I'm sad to say what was ever left of my marriage uh, quickly began to dissolve. Uh, unfortunately, um, instead of reaching out for help <laughs> to a local church, a pastor, anybody just reaching out and saying, help, I made the dumb mistake of turning to an alcohol bottle. I did my best to drink myself into oblivion. I thought as long as I was drunk, I don't have to deal with the consequences of my choices as long as I was drunk, I didn't have to face with it and deal with the guilt and the shame and the pain. As long as I was drunk, I could mask and hide from the pain that had destroyed my career, my family, taken everything from me. I remember one day coming home to my big house in Nashville. Ooh. I walked inside and I found the note on the table um, that my wife back then had left, uh, that she took my daughter and went back to Australia, and my marriage was over. Again, you think at that low point, I would have had enough sense to reach out to anybody and just say, help. But I went looking for more. Friends, you seek, you will find, whether good or bad. <laughs> I went looking for more to numb the pain, and I found a guy in Nashville uh, that was a drug dealer and he introduced me to many different chemicals. Fast forward, my career's over, my marriage is over, I'm losing everything. I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> what, I'm a drug addict now? How the heck did I get here? This wasn't part of the plan. <laughs> I never signed up for this. I signed up for the lifestyle, the success, the money, the happiness, the fame, whatever. This wasn't part of the contract. It all came to a finale for me. When one day I woke up on the floor of my kitchen, I had passed out. Thank God I didn't overdose. I have no idea how long I was out for. But as I slowly gained consciousness and, and fell back against the counter and, and tried to open my eyes, I remember I was greeted by the stench. And I looked down and I'd made a mess of myself and I was covered in my own vomit. And I just sunk so low. And I just said, that's it, I'm, I'm done, I'm done. So I went to the guy that I used to purchase drugs from. He just happened to have a gun collection. I don't know who was crazier, me or him, who was more out of their mind. I didn't even know the person I, I was becoming. I had the audacity to ask this guy, hey, mate, can I borrow one of your handguns? you got several of them. Look, that's awesome, mate. I go, can I borrow one of them? I'll bring it back on the weekend, I promise, when I come back to buy more drugs. You can trust me. We're good friends. We're buddies. We hang out. We party together. Who was crazier, me or this idiot? Because he said, okay. Thanks, good friend. So here I sat on my couch in my big house in Nashville. I'm high, I'm drunk. I'm feeling so lost, so trapped, so angry. Just, I'm a mess and I'm just being overcome, engulfed with a sense of hopelessness. You ever felt like that, folks? Just hopelessness. And I'm hearing this voice screaming in my head, condemnation, saying, you are such a failure. You are such a loser. You failed your wife, you failed your kids, your career, your ministry, your fans. Oh, but most of all, you failed God. He believed in you so much. He gave you everything. And this is how you repay him? By making a mess of everything? Pick up that gun, stick it against your head and blow your brains out because that's all you're good for, nothing. And I remember, folks, with tears running down my face, shaking, 
with a, with a gun in my hand. <laughs> I remember realizing this is it. This is strike three, <laughs> game over. There's no rainbow at the end of the story. There's no coming back from this. And I remember I closed my eyes tight with tears just streaming down my cheeks. Shaking, I just raised that gun and I stuck that barrel hard against my head. And I took in one last slow deep breath. And i got to tell you folks, I thought that was, would be the last breath I would ever breathe again. And what did I decide to do with my last breath of air? I thought I would breathe. I tried to pray one more final prayer to God. Do you even care? Do you even see me? Do you even love me? Are you even interested? Or have you turned your back on me? No idea. And I prayed one final desperate hopeless prayer to God. And folks, with a gun against my head, all I could get out was four words. All I could say was, please, God, help me. Instantly, the phone rings. Instantly, the message, the answering machine kicks on. Oh, church, let me tell you, I had that silly thing set up, so it never did that. It would normally ring forever before the message bank kicked on. This day, this moment, it was barely half a ring. And then the message bank kicks on and there's somebody leaving a voice, a message on the answering machine. Picture this, church. Here I am on my couch, a gun against my head, a millisecond away from pulling the trigger. But I'm listening to see who's leaving a message on the answering machine. Could be important, you know. A tally marketer, you need your insurance on your car renewed. <laughs> that phone call saved my life. If I could put it into words, what that phone call, the experience of what it was like for me, it was as if God Almighty... Look down from heaven. And amongst the billions of voices crying out, making noise in this world, this loving Father had the ability to hear my cry. Only today am I starting to understand the Word of God that is alive and active and powerful the ability to transform my mind, renew my mind, my life. The Word of God. Only today am I starting to understand the power of the Scripture where Jesus said, I have come that you might have life. That phone call was as if he came again and found me left for dead on the side of Lice Road. And he, he picked me up and he breathed life into this dead, lifeless body body. Only today am I starting to understand the power of the Word of God, where Jesus said, I have come to set the captives free. That phone call was as if he came again, and he broke open the prison door. He walked into my prison cell and broke the chains off, and he led me out. Friends, if you live long enough, you'll realize, oh, life doesn't always go to plan, at least not to our plan. And sometimes in spite of our best efforts, sometimes in spite of everything that's done, we can find ourselves in a mess, in a shipwreck, in a storm of destruction, feeling so broken, so lost, so hopeless. I may carry the scars for the rest of my life of the consequences of my sin that destroyed my first marriage, my career, my family, my life. But 18 years ago, when I was ready to take my life, feeling like I was so useless, so hopeless, like there was no hope for somebody like me, I met somebody. And that somebody 
It's called God of the Second Chance. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.